Excellent. All right, folks, we are now on to our next presentation, The Ethics of Open Source, A Critical Reflection. Don Goodman-Wilson. Thank you for being here, Don. Thank you. Is it, the mic, mic sounds on, yeah? Uh, is, it, again? Uh, is the microphone on? The microphone's on. Excellent. All right. Hi, my name is, uh, my name is Don Goodman-Wilson. I've got this lovely controversial title. Is it not on? Is, it, is, it, is this better? Okay, this is going to be fun because I like to gesticulate. And I don't know how to, I'm going to just turn this off, right? The mic was working before, so perhaps if we... That's fine, I'll just, I'll just do this. Um, so, uh, my name is Don Goodman-Wilson. I used to do philosophy. I also used to do computer programming type things. I used to do community. Uh, now I have a consultancy. That's lovely. Uh, and I want to talk about some news items that have come up in just the past couple of weeks. Um... Just two days ago, news about a firm called Practice Fusion broke. Uh, has anybody heard about that one? Practice Fusion was a software for, for doctors to help them uh, diagnose medical conditions uh, that also uh, suggested opioids uh, far more frequently than necessary at the request of the manufacturer of the opioids. The U.S. Air Force uh, has a new game you can play online where you can train to be a drone pilot and practice killing people, and if you enjoy it, they're happy to hire you because it's a recruiting tool. News broke about Clearview, New York Times, about two weeks ago, a company that uh, uses facial recognition technology to identify people from pictures that they've posted to their uh, public news feeds, Twitter, and so forth. It's uh, apparently surprisingly effective, um, not only identifying the person, but showing uh, where they are on Twitter and Venmo uh, and other tools like this. Uh, and although I can't prove it about Clearview, um, we can infer it about the rest. These are all powered by open source software, um, which is a little scary. Um, and I think over the past six months, there's been an increased awareness that open source software is helping to fuel um, injustice in the world. And what's particularly interesting about these examples is it's not just us who create the software who are impacted by this. It's not just those who are consuming and using the software uh, that are impacted. It is actually disproportionately people that none of us have any relationship with whatsoever uh, who are being impacted by this. The people who are being uh, terrorized by the U.S. Air Force, the people who are being prescribed opioids when they don't need them, the people uh, who would rather not have their privacy violated uh, using the software that, that we create. Um, there's been a, a number of attempts at addressing this sort of thing recently. Um, this is uh, from the Hippocratic License by uh, Coraline at MK, uh, which essentially takes an MIT-style license and adds this no-harm clause to it, uh, that the software uh, may not be used uh, in activities that uh, violate human rights as defined by the United Nations. Um, and I think experiments like this are, are uh, laudable, right? Uh, I think the time is right for us to start thinking about these sorts of experimentations. Um, but the response from the open source community at large has not been very positive. So we see things like, licenses should not be political. It's not open source. It's not, probably. Like, I'm willing to accept that as a claim. Uh, but this is also not an argument, right? This is called begging the question. I really want to dig into this in this talk. Why is the response so frequently, it's not open source? And why does this claim carry so much weight in our community? Because it does. Even the o OSI themselves, right, they weighed in on this. Um, I removed the, the, the slide here because I've only got 20 minutes, uh, and I sort of have to power through the argument that I want to make. Uh, but the OSI has been quite clear, no, this is not open source. Uh, and then, you know, refers people to this fact. Uh, on the opensource.org website, can I stop evil people from using my program? Uh, no, uh, because uh, that's not what open is, right? That's sort of the opposite of open. Um, and I just feel this tension, and I can't help but think we have ended up somewhere really bad, right? What is this tension that I'm feeling? Why do I feel bad about this? Why does this strike me, and hopefully it strikes some of you, as, uh, as absurd? Uh, and I want to dig into this question. I want to dig into this question a lot, right? Uh, so how did we get here? Where did this come from? And how do we move forward from here? And in particular, why do we hold the word open, or the concept of open, in such high esteem? Why is the appeal to the fact that something is not open source used as a conversation stopper? Right, as the final and ultimate argument why we should stop pursuing 
uh, these sorts of explorations. And I find this very curious, actually. Um, and I want to dig into the, the history a little bit. I did not touch that wire. <laughs> We're going to pretend that solved the problem. Um, so, so, so back, back in the 60s, uh, especially in the United States, we had this countercultural movement, uh, colloquially known as, as, as hippieism, right? Um, and this was a, a backlash against the authoritarian structures that existed, especially in the United States at the time, uh, by the youth of the era, uh, the boomers, as it were. Um, their goal actually uh, was to overthrow the establishment, right, through a DIY mentality and individual liberation. Uh, their goal was the creation of uh, a, a, a new utopia where we could live together in, in harmony and peace, man. Um, and it was, it was actually, I mean, it's a laudable goal, right? We want to change the world for better. We want to make the world a good place. We, we want to, like, we not want to see World War II again. We'd like not to see Vietnam again as a war. Um, and there's, a, there's this thing that came out at the time called, called the Whole Earth Catalog. Um, are you familiar with the, who, who, who's heard of the Whole Earth Catalog? So, so not a whole lot of you. We're, we're digging way back in time. So the first edition was in 67, I think, and it was printed more or less continuously up until the late 70s. And then all the way, like the last edition was published in the, the, the late 90s or the, the early 2000s. This is from the introduction of the, the first edition, Where's Gods and Might As Well Get Good At It. Okay, boomer. Um, in response to the power of government and big business, a realm of intimate personal power is developing, power of the individual to conduct his own education, find his own inspiration, shape his own environment, and share his adventure with whoever is interested. This isn't a catalog, right? This is like the hippie Sears catalog is, is what this is. This is literally like meant to disseminate information about how to acquire tools to create a new foundation for civilization. Tools like things to build geodesic domes, because these are interesting things to use as houses, but also tools uh, as, as intellectual tools, right? And the idea was that this movement, inspired by the Whole Earth Catalog, was that as we find new tools, we share them with other people, right? Because only together can we, can we create the community to bring about uh, the world that we want to see. Is this starting to sound familiar? This should sound very familiar to people in the room. Um, it's, it's no surprise that many of the people who were involved in the Whole Earth Catalog were early contributors to Wired Magazine, right? Stuart Brand comes immediately to mind. He's the guy who created the Whole Earth Catalog. Um, and Wired promulgated the twin views that technology was leading us to an inve inevitable future of personal freedom, so more technology, please, and a new capitalist order of nimble San Francisco startups was going to get us that technology. It is no coincidence that San Francisco is the center of the tech world because San Francisco was the center of the hippie world. These two things led one into the other, right? Uh, a lot of the early startups uh, uh, were founded specifically uh, as an attempt to overthrow the existing capitalist hierarchy as it existed. Let's overturn how businesses are created. Let's overturn how business is done, right? This all stems directly from this, this countercultural movement of overthrowing authority, empowering the people without power, uh, and using that to create a, a better world. Uh, this view was summed up in a critical essay called The Californian Ideology that I, I highly recommend that you go read. Um, uh, that information technologies empower the individual, enhance personal freedom, and radically reduce the power of the nation state. Existing social, political, and legal power structures will wither away to be replaced by unfettered interactions between autonomous individuals and their software. Right. It's not a huge leap to see a connection uh, between this ideology. I mean, this, this, this essay was critical, right, of this, of this view, highly, highly critical of this view, uh, but this is how they summed it up. Um, it's easy to see how this blends into something like, hey, I got a broken printer. I'd like to write the, the or I'd like access to the, uh, the software uh, for the driver so I can make it do things that the, uh, the manufacturer did not intend, right? Because the idea of proprietary printer driver software uh, is, it runs extremely counter to this, to this notion, right, of liberating people through technology, through open access to tools um, uh, to create the world that we want to see. Uh, this is a reference to Richard Solomon. I know not everybody in the room uh, is familiar with the, the history of the FSF and the, the OSI, uh, but we don't really have time to get into it. What I want to point out is that there's a, there's a very strong continuum between uh, the early 1960s counterculture um, 
and the origins of the open source movement in the 1980s and 1990s. So that sounds well and good. Um, so open source isn't political, right? I don't think so. Um, the value of openness, here's the claim that I want to make, because I want to question our assumptions and really dig into this. The value of openness is uh, that openness is a tool for creating a liberated world, a more just world, a world where people feel more empowered, right? Why then are we so afraid of moving in a direction uh, that creates more justice in the world or that is aimed at creating more justice in the world? Why are we insisting on sticking on a track that we know is creating injustice in the world? So I want to introduce this concept, the openness, or sorry, the paradox of openness. Um, and I'm going to do this by talking about the paradox of tolerance. Uh, are people familiar with the paradox of tolerance? This has become very popular in a, an American political discourse at the moment because uh, uh, American political discourse is having a bit of a similar crisis. So this comes from Karl Popper, ironically, the philosopher who first popular, or popularized the idea of, the, of openness as a path to justice. We were not going to go there just now, but this is a very interesting quote. Unlimited tolerance must lead to the disappearance of tolerance. If we extend unlimited tolerance, even to those who are intolerant, if we are not prepared to defend a tolerant society against the onslaught of the intolerant, then the tolerant will be destroyed and tolerance with them. We should therefore claim in the name of tolerance the right not to tolerate the intolerant. Now, it doesn't quite work, but we can substitute openness for tolerance here, right? And we get a very similar argument structure uh, that has the same validity as this argument. And I believe it's, I believe it's actually quite valid. Um, and make that point, what, what, what do we tolerate in the name of openness? So open source exacerbates existing injustices, right? Uh, those who are at the receiving end of the software that we create have no say in its creation, have no say in its deployment, have no say in the code itself because they may not have access to computers or the technical skills necessary, right? They have no say in the, the contracts that we form with other entities using it in the form of open source licenses. Software is used as a tool by the powerful to assert control. And very frequently the control and power that they assert is at the detriment uh, to, to the most helpless uh, in our society in the world, right? And we're contributing to this. We're contributing to this by making it easier than ever to create software. I mean, that was the goal, right? Here we are. Open source is the playground of the privileged. You and I, we learn how to code. We have free time to come events like this, to contribute to software projects. Many, in the people, many people in the world don't. Many people in the world that we want to be part of our communities cannot be because they don't have the time, they don't have the money, they don't have the experience, they don't have the equipment, they don't have the privilege to participate in the communities that we want to create. Um, and that very fact creates a, an ever-growing wall um, uh, for those without the privilege to joining um, our community. I have a, a whole other argument about this, but open source incentivizes exploiting a volunteer labor force. Um, I had to cut out a whole lot of slides uh, that led up to this in order to slice this down from an hour-long talk. Um, but you see, and many of you in the room probably are, maintainers who just don't have the freaking time uh, to answer all of your issues, um, and how frequently uh, is your software in turn being used by large corporate entities who are extracting value uh, from your free weekend labor. Some of us don't mind that. Like, that's not a judgment if you're happy giving away your labor to those who are able to extract massive value from it. Um, but not all of us are comfortable with that, right? It's not, a just, it's not a just contract that we've entered into. So I want us to denormalize this state of affairs. I want to make the world a better place. We want to make the world a better place, right? Um, let's stop asking the wrong questions and start asking the right ones. So instead of asking, is it open source? Is it politics free? Is it enforceable? These are question begging questions that are designed to shut down conversation and shut down forward progress. I don't want to hear these questions. They are not productive. This one will be, enforceability will eventually be, I think, productive. But frequently when it's asked, right, it's asked in the context of it doesn't matter. We can dismiss it because it's not enforceable. It's not really a question. It's more of a comment. That was snark. Um, so what questions should we be asking? 
this is a really good one, by the way. As a philosopher, like, I love this question. Because I'm, I'm not going to lie, philosophy doesn't have answers. Philosophy only has more questions, uh, and it always starts with, with this one. And I want to encourage you, especially, if you take nothing else away from this talk, take this away. Ask yourself this every day. Every day. But here's other good ones. What are the forces that have led us to this point in time? So I tried to line out some of them. It was a very biased history, right? I got some of the details wrong. Uh, it came from a very personal point of view. It's multifaceted. It's long. It's got lots of people doing lots of things with lots of motivations. It's not the only history, right? Um, but understanding why we are where we are now will help us understand better how to, how to move forward in the future. What do we owe to each other as people? I'm a huge fan of Scanlon's ethics. If you read the, the, the um, summary of my talk, you may, be, may have been expecting me to talk a bit more about that. But again, time. Um, but as we're writing software, we should be thinking about not just what does my community need, my community of contributors and maintainers, what, not just what does the, the, the community of people who depend upon my software need, but you should be thinking about what are, the, what are the downstream effects of this software? Because it's going to have downstream effects, whether you like it or not. Right? Um, and we should be thinking very, very seriously about what justice looks like in this context. Uh, because our software has a much, much bigger, uh, much, much bigger effect on the world uh, than we realize that it does. And then finally, how do we evolve as a community? Right? And this might well mean evolving beyond open source, right? abandoning the OSD, uh, looking for new ways of, of uh, building communities, new ways of building software as a community. Uh, and finding something uh, that allows us to continue to extract what's good about open source, because there's a lot of good about open source, don't get me wrong, right? And apply this in a new context where we can increase the amount of justice that we're creating instead of just maintaining the status quo and only worrying about the, the relatively small circle of people uh, that our software has an immediate impact on. Um, because I, I, believe, I believe we do have the power to make the world a better place. I believe we have a responsibility to leverage that power to actually make the world a better place. Uh, and I'd much rather see us succeed uh, as a community uh, than uh, go down in, in flames in, a, in an ensuing uh, tech cultural war. Um, if you enjoyed this talk, here's some resources uh, that I've collected. PRs are welcome, right? Uh, so feel free to uh, to drop other links that you find in there uh, that that might be um, uh, might be interesting to other people, um, and I think we have like two minutes. They're all gone. I have seven minutes for questions. Oh my god! I thought this was going to be a thirty minute talk. That's fantastic. Seven minutes for questions. I'm going to have to pass around this mic, aren't I? I have no idea how these things work. <laughs> is this? Oh, this is working now. I think. Two At two minutes? Yeah. Okay, that's that's what okay. I thought. All right. Same. <laughs> okay, I try to go fast. Uh, does it work? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Actually, very. <laughs> um, um, I agree with you on the symptoms that you show, but not so much on the diagnosis of things. To me, it looks more like open source is one thing, one solution that was taken at a time where, as you say, uh, well, problems were different. Um, but trying to change it may actually just be um, ignoring what is actually causing open source to be used in such ways, actually, uh, um, which to me is really down to economics and politics. You can actually ask uh, well, to the licensees to, uh, to uh, include something about harm, no harm, and, and so on. You would always have ways to, to go around that. So what is harm? Uh, if you go for repression and you in a country you uh, you harm some people, but you you know you, you I'm, I'm going to stop you right there. This is an abdication of responsibility on our part, uh, and I think that's I'm exactly the wrong kind of response to have. Uh, we have a responsibility as much as everybody else in the world to create something that's more just. And by saying, well, we we're not that powerful enough to do it. No, or, or that's we not what I say. Sorry. Uh, what I say is you should target something a bit higher up than that. We should target every level, including ourselves. We must hold ourselves accountable because we are part of the system. Even if we're at a low level in the system, even if there are machines uh, that have much, out, much greater, much more outsized impact on this, we are nevertheless responsible in some small part, and to the extent that we are, we have a moral obligation to deal with it. I understand, and it's a very good thing to do. Uh, I agree on that.
maybe we should discuss after that because I'm going to be Fair. a bit. Uh, I'll, I'll be around. Thank you. So, it, last question. This, that was it. Oh, well, well, we can take one more. We can take one more. One more question. <laughs> uh, very interesting. Should we even go further? Just you mentioned the no harm clause. Should we have a, like a do good good clause? Like mm, you can't even use this for a benign. You have to actively do good things. That would be interesting. Uh, so, so I don't. Again, I don't know what the right solution is. I am advocating a position of open experimentation, so we can find the right solution to this. Right. Uh, all I know is we haven't found the solution yet. Um, that sounds like a, a, an interesting direction to experiment. Yes, let a thousand flowers bloom, right? Okay. All right. <laughs>